Hello and welcome to the program. Today, I'm going to be talking about marriage. Why do we need to marry? And when we finally get married, are we supposed to divorce when the going gets tough? I know so many Christians today have divorced their spouses. Some are even still in the process of divorcing their spouses. And you know what? Some have remarried. But really, I'd like you to follow me by the Spirit of God because we have to use the Word of God to correct whatever has gone wrong, especially for people coming behind, the ones who are not married yet or the ones who are already in a, in a marriage relationship and, it's, and things are getting really tough. Just to prepare you, I just want to make you understand that the fact that you are divorced and you've moved on doesn't mean that you know, that's the normal pattern that God ordained for his people. But then we have to look at the word of God. What does the word of God say? So the purpose for marriage really is God bringing two holy people together, two people in his kingdom that, that have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus to bring godly children from heaven onto this earth to train them in the way of the Lord so that they will enter into the system and bring God, the word of God, the kingdom of God to bear in the system. So as a result, we have peaceful nations across the world where love, righteousness, and justice prevail. So let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 19 because like I always share with people, the home is a very important unit for God. God normally functions with a family. That's why the first marriage God did was in the Garden of Eden. And the home is important. And which is why you discover that when you look at the structure in the home, the, the prosperity and the survival of a nation actually rests on the shoulders of the men in the society. And I'll put it this way that a home is only as solid and strong as the man in that home. When I say strong, I'm not talking about physical strength. I'm talking about spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity, spiritual strength. So a home is only as solid and strong as the man in that home. And so a church, the church in the nation, it's only as strong as the families within that church. And the nation is only as strong as the churches within the nation. So the reality is that the whole pressure, or, or let me put it, not call it pressure, the onus of the survival and prosperity of the nation rests on the shoulders of the men in that nation. That's the way it is. But then the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God sent the Lord Jesus Christ to give life. So let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 19. And I take it from verse 3. Matthew 19 from verse 3. And this is Jesus Christ talking. And the, the, the Pharisees came to Christ and listened to what the word of God says. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Is it okay for a man to leave his wife, to divorce his wife for just any reason? And verse 4, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. The old King James says, let whom no man put asunder. Verse 7, then said, they said to him, 
Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put away? Praise God. You see, the guys asking these questions now realize that from what Jesus said, that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So because they know what he meant, that was why they now said, okay, if we're not supposed to go our separate ways after we're married, then why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Then he now replied in verse 8, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. Hmm. Those are heavy, heavy, heavy statements. He said, God allowed Moses to put divorce in the law because your forefathers were stiff naked. They were difficult. They were unforgiven. They walked around in anger, hatred. They were funny people. And because they couldn't forgive, that was why I allowed Moses to put it in the law. But in the beginning, it was not so. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forever. He has never changed, and he will not change. So if it's not so in the beginning, it is not so even now till kingdom comes. That's what the Bible is saying here. Not Yemi's word, the Bible. In the beginning, it was not so. Which means there are two tracks. But let me move forward a bit. I'll come back to that in a minute. And verse 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. This is serious. But let me talk about this in the beginning matter because it is, it is, it is crucial that we deal with this area. He said in verse 5, no, verse 6, he says, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. So if they are one flesh, that means that they are inseparable. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man separate. I've met people who, because they're fed up with their relationship, they say, well, how do we know that it was God that put us together in the first place? <laughs> no. If you understand what God is saying here, it's not about God putting you together. He said, he that findeth a wife. So you found her, and you decided this is the person for me. It's at the altar when you make a vow that I'm going to stay with this person for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. That is when God put you together. So it's not God that brought that person to you. No, you went and searched, but you didn't ask for God's advice, whether this is the right person or not. But whoever you bring forward, God will, God will marry because that's your wish, whether you ask him or not. So whatever God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man separate. And that's why in verse 7 they ask this question because they knew what he said, that they are inseparable. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So if it's not so then, in the beginning, it's not so now. So really, from that answer that Jesus gave, gave there are two tracks. And I'll go further so that, you can get the, so that we don't get things mixed up. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. What Christ was saying there, he's giving them two tracks, two separate tracks to follow. Number one, according to the law of Moses, you're not to divorce just for any reason. But if there's fornication or adultery, you can take that route. If you are, if you are stiff naked like your forefathers, you can't forgive, you, can't, you don't understand what marriage is all about, then go along that route. But in the beginning, it was not so. 
which means that it is still not so now. So if you, a true Christian, who knows me, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has a relationship with me, and you understand that I that created the whole of this universe with stars millions of miles apart, I can fix that relationship, then follow the track of in the beginning it was not so, and stand upon my word, and I'll act on your behalf and fix that relationship. Some people say, oh, but she was difficult. She was such a terrible woman. She was demon-possessed. Or he was a useless guy. He went out with every woman under the sun. He, he drank too much. He did this and did that. One can, what can God not fix? You're trying to use your small brain to bring God to that size that he can't do it. So the best way is, let me go. God can fix it. God is able to fix anything. The same God that stopped a lion from chewing Daniel in the lion's den, he can fix it. The same one who rescued the three Hebrew boys from the lake of from the fire, he can fix it. But we use our minds. We forget the fact that the word of God is very powerful. He said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, witches and wizards, marine spirits. And he has given us the power to bind them, to destroy their works, to disrupt their activities. And yet, so oh no, I can't cope with that person. Do you know that even when you show love to an animal, the animal shows love back. I've seen documentaries of lion cubs looked after with so much love from youth. The one that looked after the lion traveled away for years. The person came back. The lion did not see the person as food, as meat for food, but rather as a family member. The lion was hugging this person, rubbing its mane against the person, excited and happy. That's even an animal that hasn't got brain like you and I. What can God not do? So when you say, I want to go through the divorce route, I don't think God can fix it. That's what you're saying. And I know some people will be angry with this message. Please, don't be angry with the message. It's not my message. It is God speaking. If you have gone your own way and done your own thing, no problem. You're free. You're free. But the, rea but the thing is that we cannot say because some people have gone in different direction from what God expected, then we should just... Ignore the truth or cover the truth. No, the truth is still the truth. It's still the truth. Because when you get married, remember, at the altar, you, pro you open your mouth. No one open your mouth on your behalf. He said, before God and his angels in heaven and man, I vow today to marry this person for richer, for poorer, for sickness and in health. I think there are three points that you make. For better, for poor. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For sickness and in health. Till death do us part. Which means that it is only death that can separate you. You made a vow at an altar before God and man. No one opened your mouth. You said it yourself. And then later on you came back. I don't think I can go on with this relationship. Well, you forget that that vow you made was a covenant. And the God we serve is a covenant-keeping God. He is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his covenant to the letter. He won't walk away from it. So he wants children that are covenant-keeping children. And when you look in the Bible, you see so many interesting things that will baffle you. There was a man called Jephthah. Jephthah was going to go to war. And he wanted God to go to war with him to help him so he can win the war. And he made a vow. He said, Lord, if you go with me on this journey, and you help me to defeat my enemies, and bring me back home safely. He said, when I come back home, the first thing that belongs to me that I lay my eyes on, I will sacrifice to you. 
Jephthah went. God was with him. God fulfilled his own part of the bargain. He defeated his enemies. He came back home. And as he was arriving in joy and in triumph, the first person that came to meet him to receive him was his daughter. Ah. Some of us would have said, God, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you something else. The next thing that comes, I'll give to you. I can't do this. But Jephthah had to kill the girl and sacrifice the girl to God. Not that God is wicked. No. But Jephthah was a man of honor. But God is not wicked. When I read that story, I was just born again. And I was reading through the Bible. I came across the story and I said, oh, I think God is going to intervene. God did not intervene. And guess what? He did not intervene. And I was asking God. At that time, I was beginning to develop my hearing of the Holy Spirit. I said, but why? And God said, when you come before me, you don't open your mouth and talk carelessly. Because I don't talk carelessly. So don't come before me and make a careless vow. If he had come to me and said, Lord, if I win the war and come back, I'll give you the biggest jar of olive oil I can see. That's fine. Or I'll give you just a gallon of olive oil. That is fine. Or I'll kill a chicken to celebrate or a goat. Fine. But to just come and just open your mouth foolishly. Oh, whatever belongs to me that I lay my hands on first will be yours. It's got nothing to do with God. It's the man. But the man was a man of honor. He killed the girl. That's why when I was reading that Bible, the Holy Spirit took me to Psalm, Psalm 15, which is heavy. Psalm 15, the book of Psalms, chapter 15. It is heavy. Psalm 15, verse 4. Listen to what the Bible says here. And it says, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Jephthah swore to his own hurt. He did not change. God said he will honor such people. You've come to an altar, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. That vow you made was to your own hurt. For some of us, when pressure comes, we change. But let me read that psalm again, so that you see that how important it is before God. He said, he who swears, he said, but he honors those who fear God. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Because of God, you refuse to change. You refuse. So he made a vow. And even if you're talking about the person, your spouse, committing adultery or fornication, whatever it is, in the eyes of God, that is not even as important as a vow. It's not important as a vow. If it's important, there are certain things God would have done differently. Let me give you one example. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel, passed through the lineage of a prostitute called Rahab? You might say, ah. Why would a holy child pass through a prostitute? <laughs> that is God trying to show you that what you think is important. Oh, she has fornicated. Oh, he has committed adultery. Oh, it's not important to him. He wants you to learn forgiveness. He wants you to learn certain principles that will make life beautiful for you. Jesus Christ came through the lineage of Rahab, a prostitute. That's the Holy One of Israel who came to save you and I. I want to hear another one. 
There's a prophet called Hosea. Hosea was asked by God to marry a prostitute. So what do you say to that? Oh, fornication. So I'm trying to make you understand that the fornication bit of our adultery is not as important as the vow you make at an altar. That vow is binding. That's why God said in the book of Malachi, I hate divorce. Even he himself could not divorce Israel. <laughs> he couldn't. It is sealed. Like Steve Wonder's song, signed, sealed, and delivered. So the Bible said in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, let me, let me just quickly look at Malachi chapter 2, verses 15 and uh, 16. Malachi 2, 15 and 16. He said, but he, did he not make them one? That means husband and wife, one, you see again. But did he not make them one? Having a remnant of the spirit. And why one? Why one? He seeks godly offspring. God is looking for godly offsprings. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none, let nobody deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Because it's common amongst men to just go and misbehave. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with, garment with violence says the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. This is serious stuff. So the vow you made at the altar is binding. So that is why in a relationship, if the man decides to leave, if someone decides to divorce the other, and the other one said, I'm not divorcing you, I'm going to stand upon the word of God. That means that the one that wants to go would have to pay with their lives because the Bible said, because at the altar, it said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Let me quickly go back to the book of Matthew. Matthew 19. So till death do us part. But then if the two go their separate ways and they get married and they move on, then it's zero, no problem. But if one of them insists on sticking to the covenant, to the vow that was made at the altar, then that means the other guy is going to have to pay. I've seen so many cases of people who just died unnecessarily. I know of a pastor, left his wife. Oh, I think she's a witch. He's going to marry someone else. That wife waited. She went through deliverance to figure out why is this happening to me? And she waited and waited and waited, and guess what? The pastor had to go. Another pastor, so many of us know the same thing. He too left his wife, not for adultery, not for nothing, went with someone else. The Lord waited and waited, he had to go. In Brazil, I met a pastor's wife, the wife of a gentleman. He too was misbehaving. My brother told her, don't divorce him, stay there. As long as he's not beating you or violent towards you, stay there. She stayed. He was driving to the airport one occasion, had a massive heart attack, dead and gone. I've, I've seen cases. That is why we need to be very, very careful. We need to be careful. Because when you make a, make a vow, the vow is already loaded in the spirit realm. It's got nothing to do with God anymore. That's why if you go to a Freemasons meet, meeting, you make a vow, it is binding. It's got nothing to do with God anymore. So we need to understand how these things work because they are the, the laws of the spirit cannot be broken. They cannot be broken. They've been set in place. Set in place. So let's move quickly forward. Verse, uh, um, Matthew chapter 19. Uh, verse, uh, I'll take it from verse 3. Uh, sorry, verse 11. It says, But he said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. That's why I'm telling you, I was telling you from the beginning, this message is not for everybody. 
is for some people that they themselves know that this message is ordained for me. So please, don't attack the message or the messenger. All you got to say is that if you don't like it, it is not for me. It's for someone else. And because it's for someone else, that person is for someone else somewhere. So it says, except for those that is given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have been made who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, like Paul Apostle. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. And you know, when the disciples heard this, listen to what they said in verse 10. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Because they knew what the Lord Jesus was saying, that look, this thing, in the beginning it was not so. But if you want to go like your forefathers who are wicked, then go through the divorce. But in the beginning, it was not so. Because, so what was happening that the disciples were able to see through and say, no, this thing means that don't just get into it anyhow. Be careful. That's why they themselves said in verse 10, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But we know people marry because a lot of them burn. But you know what? I pray that this message will have an impact upon your life and the ones who it's meant for will take it on board and run with it. And then also encourage you, share with your children who have married age. God bless you. Bye for now.